want to call your attention tonight to the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter. And while you're finding that, let me uh, take a moment to acknowledge and thank Pastor Shepard for another chance to stand here and minister the Word of God. Amen. Thank God for all of you, the wonderful people of God here on tonight. The book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, we'll begin reading at verse number one. The word of the Lord is so recorded. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endures such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Amen? I want to teach tonight uh, from this thought, you have to deal with it. Amen? You have to deal with it. All right? Let's go before the Lord Father. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for this night. Thank you, Lord God, for your spirit and your presence in this place, God. I thank you for your people that have come tonight to hear from you, Lord God. I ask God that you would speak. God, if you don't speak, I don't know what we will do. I pray, God, that all flesh would be silent, that your spirit would be glorified in this place, Lord God. Teach us tonight from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. I want to... Uh, Start off talking about this is a very uh, familiar passage of scripture, um, and the text starts off with the word "wherefore," uh, which lets us know that um, it's alluding to the previous uh, chapter, right? Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about uh, with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And what he's referring to there is in the previous chapters, we have the, what's commonly known as the heroes of faith. Um, all of the Old Testament saints and how God dealt with them and how uh, they exhibited faith um, in believing God and doing the will of God as it pertained to their lives. And the scripture is telling us to look backwards at those and their examples, the examples that they set for us, and consider this cloud of witnesses that have gone before us and the struggles and the sufferings and everything that they went through. And then, because we have them as examples, then we ought to be able to lay aside every weight and the sin which does set us back, all right? Now, uh, I want to start off by, by, by letting you in on a little secret, okay? It might be a big secret for some of us, and that is everyone has a struggle. I'm talking about you can go to the most pristine of Christian homes and everyone is dealing with something. Well, how do you know that, Brother McClary? Because we are in the flesh. And as long as we are in the flesh, we are dealing with something. Amen? And, and, and when, when you can get to a point where you feel like you have arrived and you've got life whipped and, and, and you, you know, nothing could come upon you that, that can, you know, that can rattle you or, uh, now, now let me keep it straight. Listen, we're never losing our faith in God. It, it doesn't matter what comes our way. We're never going to stop trusting God. But the fact of the matter is 
that as long as we are in this flesh, there are going to be things that we are going to have to deal with. Amen? And a lot of times, saints of God, God allows things to happen to us. Why? To keep us on our knees. Amen? Because if we don't have issues sometimes, we won't pray. And so sometimes God allows storms because the Bible talks about him, talks about us building our faith. And one of the ways in which we build our faith is through trials and tribulations. And so we have to deal with the issues of life when we're in this walk. Every one of us. And so uh, when it talks about Laying aside the, uh, the, the weight and the sins. And so you might, not, you might not have the same struggle, Brother Peter, that Brother Wilson has. But you're struggling with something. And the Bible tells us that if we confess our faults, God is faithful and just to forgive us. And so what happens to us is we get caught up in, in our issues. And I don't want to always say uh, the Bible refers to them as weights and sins. It might not, might, might not necessarily be a sin, but it could be something that's impeding your growth in the Lord. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be some, some dreaded or deadly sin, but anything that's impeding your growth in the Lord is an issue. And the fact of the matter is, saints, we have to deal with these things. We can't sit there and ignore and act like we're all pristine because you'll never be able to give God the true worship, the true, true praise that he deserves from you because you are shrouded by these issues. And again, I, I start off by saying everyone has them. So how do we deal with it? How, well, first of all, you've got to admit it and acknowledge it. I'm not telling you you have to. Listen, Jesus went to the cross. So you don't have to come to me and confess anything. You don't have to go to your pastor and confess everything. When he died on Calvary, he gave you a direct line. You've got the red line directly to him. But I will tell you this. There are times when we are dealing with things you know, even, I'll, I'll say for myself as a brother or as a man, there are times I might have to go to another brother and say, listen, brother, I need you to pray for me. I need you to, to, to lift me up in this area. And we've gotten away from that, that, that place where we feel comfortable going to our brother or our sister and asking them to lift, them, lift us up for fear of being judged by them. We don't want to be judged. We don't want folks to know that we're struggling with anything. So we internalize everything. And as long as you're holding those things on the inside of you, you're not giving God true worship. You're not giving him true. There's no way you can give him true worship and praise when you are harboring secret sins. So how do you deal with it? You've got to talk about it. There's someone you can trust. There's someone you can talk to. There's someone you can confide in. And let them know that you're struggling with this thing. So we can pray about it. So we can fast about it. How do we, you know how we overcome the struggles and the issues that life throws up? You've got to fast it out. See, we, we've gotten to this place where we only fast now in October. You've got to fast all year long. I understand that the church fast is in October, but you can't wait till October to start praying and fasting. It should be, a, you should have a daily or a weekly ritual when it comes to fasting and praying. That's how you break the yokes of the enemy. When you consecrate yourself, I'm not talking about just dieting. Huh? There's a difference between fasting and dieting. Dieting is just not eating. 
Fasting is not eating naturally, but eating spiritually and spending time with God. You close yourself off from the world. You put yourself in a room or in a closet. You push that plate back. You get in the face of God and you tell God, I'm struggling with something and Lord, I need you to help me. And when you keep it before God, it might not break the first first time you fast. You might have to fast more than once. You may have to fast more more than one or two days. But whatever you have to do to break that yoke, you stay in the face of God until you get rid of the weight or the yoke that the Bible said so easily beset us. That word beset actually, uh, and actually this, this text as Paul, uh, many people, uh, most people give Paul credit for the book of uh, Hebrew because it's very synonymous with his other writings. Um, but and often in Paul's writing, you find him making reference to the Olympic Games. And uh, this word beset here, and it's actually this whole uh, text here somewhat, when he's talking about um, running with patience, the race that is set before us. He's referring to the games. But the word beset from the original uh, um, Greek literally means um, somewhat, let me see see if I can put it in the correct term. It literally means well standing around. In other words, it's, it's almost like an enemy on all sides. It means well, you're surrounded by an enemy. That's what the word besets mean. It means that every, every way you turn, there's an obstacle. Every way you try, you, go, you can't go back because it's there. It's like what Paul said in, in the book of uh, uh, Romans. When I would do good, evil is right there. Uh, seven, Romans 7 chapter, chapter, evil is right there before me. When I, when I would do good, every which way I turn, that, that's what it means when it says besetting. You are surrounded by this thing. In other words, you've been struggling with this thing for so long that you can't get away from it. You you don't know how to get away from it. And I'm telling you, how to get away from it is you got to put it before God through prayer and fasting. Don't let it whip you. Don't let it keep you bound. Don't let it keep you secluded and isolated. God does not intend for you to carry that weight or that sin all the way into glory. He he didn't save you for you to carry your past. He didn't save you for you to carry the stuff that happened in your your ancient history. (coughs) Excuse me. That the enemy is always, you know, reminding you of. Always putting your your past in, in your face. And oftentimes we allow that stuff to get in our spirits and cause us to become bitter. And God does not desire for us to live that way. God, when he saves us, he desires for us to live clean. You have to understand, you've got to believe, saints of God, that you have been delivered. That Jesus did die for your sins. And no matter what you've done in your past, the slate is clean when you give your life to Jesus. I don't care what the devil said. He's a liar and the father of it. So you have to have confidence <coughs> excuse me, and boldness in who you are. You have to have that confidence that I have been redeemed, that God has forgiven me, that greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. I don't care what I used to be. I don't care what I used to be. I am no longer the same person. Why? Because Jesus said so. Hallelujah. And so... Paul says here, let us lay aside the weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us. Again, he's alluding to the Olympic Games. And do you know how those that competed in the games and the races that ran in the race, you know how they competed? No? 
naked. They complete. They competed naked because they wanted to be light. They didn't want anything weighing them down. Anything that was going to cause them to be at a disadvantage in the race. Uh, we went to California some uh, some years ago. I went out to the uh, uh, the specialized factory where they make uh, specialized bicycles, and I, I got the opportunity to sit in in the wind tunnel. This is where they test all of their new bicycles, and they have these uh, professional cyclists that actually sit on the, these bikes, and that's how they they. They got a whole lot of technical stuff that they do just to buy these professional bicycles. And do you not know that these uh, professional cyclists, that they literally shave their legs and their arms? They are that concerned about being affected by the wind in so much that they shave the hairs off their, their legs and their arm because they feel that it could put them at a disadvantage? That's how we have to be when it comes to running for God. We have to be willing to shave and cut off anything that's going to slow us down. I don't care if it's a friend. I don't care if it's a job. I don't care if it's family members. I don't care what it is. Anything that's going to get in my way and keep me from getting close to God, that's going to slow me down from running the race, I want it away from me. Now, you might think, that's, that's, man, that's kind of far-fetched. But think about that. They're concerned about the hairs on their arms affecting their speed when they ride. I mean, that, 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 <laughs> that, is, that is elite. I mean, that is, that is some serious cycling. And they measure this in the wind tunnel. And that is the way that we must manage the race when we're running for the Lord. I don't care how small it is. If it's going to slow me down, Lord, take it out of my life. If, if it's going to impede my process, Lord, take it out of my life. And, and, it, say, and it says that, that said, we must run with patience. The race that is set with before us. What is that telling us? This is not a sprint. It's a marathon. you got to have patience. Why? Because there are going to be things that's going to challenge you. There are going to be obstacles that you're going to be faced with when you run this race. And you've got to be patient enough to say, Lord, I don't know why I'm going to through this particular area or this particular storm in my life. But I'm going to stand here and trust you and wait. I'm not going to be weary. I'm not going to let the devil whip me and cause me to give up my faith. Because as I said, you're going to go through a trial. And we've got to run. The analogy here is someone that's running. Saints of God, this is not something I remember... Uh, preaching this not too long ago about the urgency. Running intimates urgency. We're running this race. This is not something that, that we just kind of loudly gag, oh yeah, I'm saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy. What? There's got to be an urgency about saving souls. There's got to be an urgency about witnessing the people. There's got to be an urgency. You know, I was thinking tonight, today uh, how times have changed. You see, when I grew up as a kid, <laughs> they, they preached hell and brimstone. <laughs> and and mo mo most of the folks <laughs> in my era, they came to God because they were afraid of going to hell. But see, this generation, we preach so much God is love. God is so much love that we've convinced people that they can live in sin and God's love. But that's not, the, that's not what the Bible tells us. Paul asked the question, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. We can't continue in sin just because we know God's going to forgive us. No. 
But this generation and, and so many preachers these days, they, they focus on, and I, God loves us. We know that. But he doesn't love us enough to tolerate our sins. If you're going to live for God and we're going to be the children of God, saints of God, holiness without no man shall see the Lord. No man. You've got to be holy and you've got to be proud of it. You can't, you can't be ashamed of who you are. You've got to be proud to be saved. You've got to be proud to tell somebody that I'm filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, that I've been baptized in Jesus' name. I'm excited about it. Am I talking to anybody here tonight? Hallelujah. The Bible says, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher, of our faith. Problem. One of the biggest problems we have in our society today, we're not looking to Jesus anymore. We're looking to everything else except him to try to fulfill our needs and try to, you know, uh, quench our, 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 our thirst. Look to Jesus. Not the alcohol bottle. This, this, this generation, I mean, uh, there's so many. Weed is just like, uh, un, I can't believe. Everybody smokes it. When I grew up, you'd go to jail for that. I mean, everybody, women, men, it, it amazes me. It's like this phenomenon. Oh, it's not going to harm you. And your brain cells are kind of just dying. Oh, I need it to help with my pain. Well, y'all, y'all heard it. Yeah, but that, that's the word. That, a professional word. That's a big word. A five dollar word. It's for medicinal purposes. No, you don't need that. The Bible said Jesus is our healer. Amen. Amen. You mean you got to get high to feel good? Come on, saints. I mean, it, it, this, you look at the way the world has shifted. And, and Paul tells us to lay, lay aside the weight and the sins. This world today has a problem identifying what sin is. Amen. They want to rewrite what sin is. And what God calls sin, they're saying it's okay. The devil is a lie. Yeah, right. Ooh, glory. And he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. That, ter that, that term despising from the, from the original Greek means to think against the shame. And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Listen, when people try to belittle you, when people try to make you feel less than because of your faith, oh, I hope I'm, I hope I'm helping somebody here tonight. I'm, hope, I'm hoping that, that, I'm, that I'm raising up something in you that's going to give you a boldness about who you are. That when you walk out of here, you're going to walk out of here with a different attitude about your salvation and what it means to be a child of God. Amen. That when you walk in that job tomorrow, when you walk wherever it is you go tomorrow, the gym or whatever, that people are going to start taking notice that there's something different about this person. Because you're going to carry yourself a little bit different. Because you're going to have a confidence about who you are and who it is that you serve and who it is that you belong to. Amen. That's the attitude that we need to have as children of God. But a lot of times we can't present or we can't exude that attitude because we've got those little secret things, that little albatross that hangs around our neck that we haven't allowed God to deliver us from. And then some folks, you go, you go talk to them, you tell them what you, that you're struggling with whatever that you're going through, and they say within their mind, well, wow, wait a minute. Oh, I ain't doing so bad. If you're struggling with that, I'm all right. No. It doesn't work like that. 
place. We've got to be holy and be happy about it. And the Bible says in chapter 3, it says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Every time you start feeling weak, every time you start feeling discouraged, every time you feel like giving up, think on Jesus. Consider what he went through for you. Consider what he suffered for you. Consider the, 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 the beating that he took for you. That's what he's telling us here. When you get weary, listen, if you don't, he said, if you don't think on him, listen to what he says. Verse 3, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. You can't think about what the world is doing. You can't think about what, 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 what other folks are doing. Think about what Jesus went through for us. Think about how he suffered for us. When you feel like, oh, my God, I feel like, is it worth it anymore? It's worth it. It's worth every minute of going through it. It's worth every tear you've cried, every, every night you stayed up, every worry you've had. It's been worth it to be living for the Lord. It's worth it. Verse 4 says, ye have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin he's telling us that there are people who gave up their life for this cause and you haven't done that yet you haven't done that yet you, you haven't gone to, 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 to the extent of shedding blood to deny and fight sin and to stand on faith in Jesus Christ. You haven't gone that far yet. Saints of God, I want you to walk out of here with a new boldness tonight. I want you to walk out of here and think about every little thing that's impeding your process, your progress. Think about the people in your life that are having negative influences on you. Thinking about the places that you go that, that make you kind of shy back from your faith. Think about the people that, 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 that have that, that edge on you that make you feel uncomfortable when you come around them. And then gird up your loins and say, you know what? I know who I am in the Lord. I'm no longer, hallelujah, I'm no longer going to be ashamed. I'm no longer going to be a, a shy and quiet about my faith. I'm no longer going to hold on to these little, these little weights and these little burdens, the things that are keeping me from giving God my everything. I want to be like that cyclist that sits up in that wind tunnel and said, I want even the little hairs on my arms to be shaved off because I don't want them to interfere with the race that I'm running for the Lord. You've got to deal with this stuff. You can't, you're not going to make it just concealing it. Trying to cover it up and, and, and pretending. Ooh, somebody said it this way. God can't bless who you pretend to be. Huh? He wants to bless the real you. Huh? But you got to present the real you to him. And I'm not, I'm not, you know, picking. I don't, I don't know any sin that anyone has committed or anything like that. I'm just telling this because I know for a fact because we're all human. There are things that keep me on my knees, that keep me before the Lord and say, God, I need you to help me with this. So it's not about, you know, trying to make anyone feel guilty. This is something that all of us have to do. We have to be real with ourselves. And we have to identify those little quirks, those negative things, those negative peoples, those negative attitudes. Attitudes hurt a lot of us. Hmm? We hold, we, oh God, some of us, got, we got grudges. We got so many grudges that we hold in grudges for other folks. Huh? 
Huh? What did they do? They didn't do nothing to me, but they did something to my brother. I'm holding their grudge. <laughs> what are you? I'm a professional grudge holder. Huh? You got a grudge you can't hold? Give it to me. I'll hold it for you. Let that stuff go, saints. It weighs you down. It's like a cancer. It'll eat at you. It weighs you down. Get rid of the weights. Get rid of the sin. And then see how, how it feels to just worship and praise God in the beauty of holiness. Let's stand together. I hope this message, this lesson, I hope it encourages you to take a look inside, internally, and realize that there are things that you need to allow God to deal with in your life. And you, you, you might have to take a trip back to the altar. You, you might, I don't know what it is, you, but you've got to deal with it. You've got to deal with it because God desires to shine through you. God desires that when you walk out in the public, when you go to the grocery store, when you go to work, no matter where, you're in the gym, wherever you go, God desires to just shine through you. He wants the glow and the glory of his grace to be on you. And people will be able to look at you and say, man, there's something about you. But until you can rid yourself of the baggage, you're going to limit what God can do through you. Amen? And I want God, I want him to get all of me. I want him to have it all. I, I, God, help me with my idiosyncrasies. Point them out to me, Lord God, and, 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 and let, let me, help me to deal with them. Take them from me. Point them out to me and help me, give me the wisdom enough to acknowledge it and recognize, God, that it's me and that I need you. Amen? So I'm going to pray tonight, and if you feel the need to come to the altar, you know, I'm going to leave it up to you. We're going to uh, give it a, a space. If you feel there's something you want to talk to God about, the altar is going to be open. But saints of God, in order for us to have revival, in order for us to be able to win the lost when they come in here, in order for us to be able to effectively minister to other folks, we've got to clean ourselves up. We've got to be righteous. We've got to be holy. Let's go before the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, this is your word, God, that I believe that you've given for us tonight. God, I pray that you begin to walk through this room and search every heart. Father, you know every struggle. You know every trial, God. You know every secret thing that we are concealing. I pray, God, that you give us the boldness, oh God, to acknowledge our sins and help us, God, to confess them. Help us, God, and deliver us, Lord God, because we want to serve you. We want to praise you, God. We want to give you our all. We want to give you our everything, Lord. Help us tonight, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord God.